Chief, Deputy Chief or uh, Chair Nanduke Nansar. Uh, another great project, Project Rome, another uh, catch and uh, we really applaud uh, our police law enforcement agencies and uh, especially including Peel Regional Police for the great job in every investigation they do. And rightly said, as Chair Nando said, if police has the resources, they can do anything. Uh, but the question is, um, uh, these 10 individuals, they are charged and arrested. Are they released also? Because when we put the question to a Justice Minister, he said already amendments were done in the criminal code. And in the previous investigations of the extortions, of the carjackings, we saw and the biggest goal heist. All those criminals are enjoying their lavish life out. And the person who was arrested in US, he is behind the bars facing trial. So are these individuals out on the streets because they are dangerous? Are they out on the streets or they are behind the bars? Thank you. I can say that uh, as far as uh, the bail hearings uh, have gone, uh, seven of these individuals were uh, were held for bail hearings. Uh, two have uh, are still waiting for their bail hearing date, so they're in custody. Uh, two have been denied bail, um, and then the others have been uh, granted bail. We, we see in many of these cases, um, some of them, as Detective S Sergeant Scott uh, spoke to, kept in custody. Some do get released with conditions. Um, this is a continual part of our um, our efforts, as you know, here in Peel, along with our partners that are sitting here with us, have been very strong advocates for those involved in violent crime offenses, inclusive of firearms ones, to be treated differently than the broader segment of those brought before the courts. And um, we know that one person possessing a firearm one day is likely a victim another day or the perpetrator of a firearms offense. Um, and a small amount of people create the greatest number of harm. So, you know, behind the scenes, to your question, is uh, these would be the offenses that we would advocate for or have the ser most serious impact on our community and need to be treated that way. Uh, this is a unified approach across uh, the chiefs right across Ontario. Uh, but to your point, we do agree, and I know this government is, uh, has been listening to some of our suggestions and proposals, but uh, the court process needs to uh, unfold to determine what the outcome is. And I wanted to top that up as well. Thank you very much for your question, and you've mentioned it before. Um, you know, it's got to be a tough job when you're in enforcement and you do everything you do to achieve this, and then you find out a day later they're on the streets. As you know, it's been a topic of great discussion in the region of Peel and around my table. And I want to give a shout out to Mayor Brown of Brampton and one of my regional colleagues who's gone so far as to go to Ottawa and tell them something has to be done with this revolving door justice. You know, it sounds like a joke. We've talked about the problems with the car thefts, but actually happened here in our GTA jurisdiction. Some guy's up before a judge for having stolen a car, gets let off and went into the parking lot of the courthouse and stole another car. You can't make this stuff up. And that's what gets people frustrated. But can you imagine what it does to our enforcement people that say, here we are doing what it takes, the countless hours, efforts, energy, risk, and then we find out it's a bit of a catch and release system. Uh, I must tell you, because you asked the question, I'm glad, it is top of mind concern for my council and our mayors that everybody involved from the federal government on down needs to have a cold hard look at what it is when we allow people who are the perpetrators of crime to freely go out and the record shows commit more crime while they're waiting for a hearing date something's got to give there and my heart goes out to the victims and to the people in uniform that say they must want to beat their heads against the wall when they get home some nights and say what is the point of this if i know these people are back out on the street so thank you very much for your question uh, your question I know it is being reviewed in earnest, but we need stronger results on that file, especially from our federal partners. Thank you. Uh, Chief, uh, you once mentioned that we have the longest, largest, undefended border with U.S. And we are in 21st century. We have U.S. with us, the technology master. What suggestion you want to give to our CBSA or the federal government or any other government how can we control, because our vehicles are going out, 20, recent uh, Peel Police report says 20 vehicles per day in the region, still we are uh, facing that issue. So vehicles are going out of the country, drugs and ammunitions are coming in. How can we protect our borders 
with the help of US agencies, because it's an undefended border. So what is the solution? We have drone technology. We have very big technology. What is the solution for that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nitin. You know, let me just paint the picture. You know, we here, as everybody would be aware, is aware of our uh, federal regulatory system for prohibited and restricted firearms. But then if you look to our, you know, our brothers and sisters in, in the U.S., uh, just across the border, to your point, um, you know, we have states that are uh, moving to permitless concealed carry. So, you know, the, the polarization between the prevalence of firearms in the U.S., which clearly is, you know, uh, a different environment, to where we are just as conducive to more firearms being here. Uh, as you can see, you know, some of them, especially when they're dismantled, are in very small, uh, uh, you know, sizes. They can easily be concealed, whether it be through airmail, freight, vehicles, people walking across or through the air. So it does pose a significant problem to us. And hence, you know, we know this is why we're seeing an increase right across Ontario and the GTA with the volume and presence of firearms. What I can tell you, though, is that these discussions are not new to the policing sector. Uh, in, a, in a nutshell, not just at the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, but the Ontario Association of Chiefs of Police, we've advocated for three strong spaces. One is to uh, strengthen our capacity, just like this investigation demonstrated. The better we are able to work collaboratively with our U.S. partners, where they are supported, we are supported from information, uh, funding and resources for cross-border strengthening, we can work our way backwards to where these firearms are coming from. That's one. The second is to ensure that uh, here in Ontario, and this is a perfect example of it, that we continue to be supported with cross-municipality uh, uh, enforcement initiatives, the joint forces initiatives. They're extremely critical. They're very expensive, time-consuming, and the investigators that we're utilizing for them are not just sitting around waiting, they're doing other duties here. So in order to support that, it does need continued support, which we were able to acknowledge through the uh, province and CISO, that's a second piece. The third is um, ensuring that we get the proper formative, legislative and regulatory reforms as it relates to firearms offenses. Um, we do believe that needs to change, not just from the offenses themselves, but our ability to see the courts apply different penalties and judgments to that. So those are the three big spaces. They're the playbook which we've been talking about. Obviously may not solve the whole situation, but it's absolutely the right.